Hello, my name is Vivek Reddy. I'm a professor of medicine at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City and the director of the Cardiac Electrophysiology Service at Mount Sinai Hospital. The purpose of this video is to talk about ventricular tachycardia. Uh, what is it? How do we manage it? Specifically with regards to catheter ablation. Again, this is, I'm going to be speaking in a very general sense, so how this relates to your particular medical condition is something you should discuss with your physician. When we think about ventricular tachycardia, the first and most important question that we ask is, what is the setting for the ventricular tachycardia? And briefly, that means, is it ventricular tachycardia in the setting of a structurally normal heart or in the setting of a structurally abnormal heart? Why does this matter? Well, if you have ventricular tachycardia in the setting of a structurally normal heart, this is typically not a life-threatening condition. It can be problematic, it can cause you to faint, it can cause you to feel uncomfortable, but it doesn't typically um, degenerate into something that we call ventricular fibrillation or cardiac arrest. So when one has ventricular tachycardia in the setting of a normal heart, we can, uh, as first-line therapy, we can treat with either drugs or with catheter ablation. Catheter ablation means that we manipulate a catheter into the heart to the location causing the problem, and then we cauterize that location that's causing the ventricular tachycardia. Now let's talk about ventricular tachycardia in the setting of a structurally abnormal heart. This is the more usual situation where for one of, any, one of several reasons, the heart may be abnormal because of a previous heart attack or some other reason, and, um, uh, and as a result of this, ventricular tachycardia occurs. Now, unlike in the setting of a normal heart, in an abnormal heart, this typically is a life-threatening condition. But this is the kind of ventricular tachycardia that, re that degenerates into a cardiac arrest. And um, typically, patients who have ventricular tachycardia in an abnormal heart you typically require a defibrillator. What is a defibrillator? Or all, you may have already know about this or you may know someone who has a defibrillator. These are devices that are like pacemakers placed at the chest, either um, at the top of the chest or in the side uh, with a wire that goes either into the heart or uh, stays underneath the skin. And these are devices that basically sit there, they watch the heart, and if your heart should suddenly go into this abnormal heart rhythm, they shock the heart back into regular rhythm. These are very effective devices. They've saved countless numbers of, of lives, and uh, are, these are typically our first-line therapy. While these are effective devices, um, they're not, they don't treat or they don't um, uh, treat the underlying problem, which is the ventricular tachycardia itself. They treat the result of it, and um, the way they treat this, that is by shocking the heart back into regular rhythm, can be quite uncomfortable. So even though defibrillators are commonly used, there are many patients with defibrillators where we also have to use medications in order to prevent the VT because we don't want, um, we don't want patients to continuously get defibrillator shocks. The other option is something called catheter ablation. So in patients who either have had shocks or who are at high risk for shocks, we consider catheter ablation. Now, before we talk about catheter ablation, let's talk about the different medical conditions um, that comprise these abnormal hearts. Well, the most common is a previous heart attack. When one has had a heart attack, uh, there's abnormal tissue that, that forms that can cause this tachycardia. There's also something called cardiomyopathy, where it's not a heart attack, but the heart just becomes weak, uh, can result in heart failure, and importantly, can also cause ventricular tachycardia. There are a few other rarer conditions that also cause tachycardia. Three of them include right ventricular dysplasia, also called RV dysplasia, which is an interesting condition in the sense that the heart is, is structurally not that abnormal, but um, can cause this ventricular tachycardia, meaning that the heart function is, is typically normal, and one doesn't have heart failure, but these tachycardias can occur. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a condition where the heart tissue becomes very thick and it can become fibrotic and scar tissue can occur and also cause tachycardia. And sarcoidosis is a rare condition in which there's fibrosis that occurs in the lungs and even the heart. And when it occurs in the heart, it can cause ventricular tachycardia. In all these conditions, what's common is that there is scar tissue in the heart. And if you look at the cartoon on the left, the idea is when you have scar tissue, and when you have live tissue that's interspersed within the scar, then you can have the circuit that develops. That middle image, um, that movie shows actually a map in one of our patients with ventricular tachycardia. You can see the scar tissue and you can see the red um, activation as this, um, as this tachycardia traverses in between these two scars and, um, and causes this, uh, this circuit. Now, I showed you a relatively simple circuit. 
The problem is that the simple circuit is not what typically happens. What typically happens is what you see in the, in the, in the right image, and particularly the bottom right image, where you have multiple potential pathways, multiple uh, live, uh, fibros of live tissue interspersed within the scar. Any of these could form a circuit. So when we think about ventricular tachycardia, we're not thinking just about individual circuits. We're thinking about a mass of tissue from which multiple circuits can emanate. So to, so to treat tachycardia in this situation, we need to treat the whole substrate. How do we do this? Well, this short shows the progression of what happened. Again, the image on the left is, is the, shows a, it's a cartoon of where the scar is, uh, which is uh, the thinner part of the tissue, and you see the circuit that's in between the scar and the normal tissue. Those two middle images depict the, pre the surgical procedures that were used in the past. These were very effective approaches, but they were also very invasive approaches. In fact, at this, at this point, um, surgery for ventricular tachycardia is extremely rare. There are very few centers in the world that even do this, and even those do this quite rarely. And the reason is because we have medications, we have defibrillators, and we have catheter ablation. So instead of requiring surgery, we can manipulate a catheter through the vein into the heart and through the artery into the heart and place these ablation lesions that you see as red dots in these locations to uh, modify the substrate and uh, terminate the ventricular tachycardia. And that's the approach that we use in the majority of patients. But in some patients, it can be difficult. And I'm going to go through um, some of the 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 let's say, the advanced approaches that we use in order to treat difficult cases of ventricular tachycardia. The first approach we use is hemodynamic support. You know, during tachycardia, the heart rate is going very fast and the blood pressure is not very well maintained. So we use catheters such as these that we can place into the heart. Um, and this is one such example that's placed uh, across the aortic valve, which is the main valve that separates the heart from the rest of the body. And there's a, this, this catheter has a pump inside of this, which can basically push blood from the heart out into the, into the bloodstream. So this is a way to augment the effect of the heart, to increase the pumping ability of the heart. We use this catheter oftentimes um, in, during our ablation procedures in patients who have severe heart dysfunction or who have very fast tachycardias that don't allow us to map them very carefully during the tachycardia. The next approach is something we call epicardial ablation. You know, normally when we introduce the catheters through the veins and the arteries, we enter the inside of the heart. But sometimes the circuits are on the outside of the heart. So what we do is we put the catheter directly from under, under the rib cage, outside the heart, and we manipulate the catheter. And what you see there is how the catheter can be easily manipulated, freely manipulated outside the heart. Again, this is not a surgical approach, this is a catheter approach. Apocardial ablation is um, oftentimes required for certain conditions like right ventricular dysplasia or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or even patients with cardiomyopathy. So whether or not this approach is, a, is appropriate for you really depends on your medical condition. Again, something to discuss with your doctor. Sometimes we can't ablate the tachycardia because the circuit is deep in the heart tissue and we can't reach it with the catheter. And sometimes we do something called alcohol ablation. Alcohol ablation means that we actually identify the blood vessel that's supplying blood to, this, to the tissue that's causing this uh, tachycardia. Then we um, put a catheter into that blood vessel and we inject alcohol into that blood vessel, which basically ablates um, all that tissue that's going into the circuits. Um, this is an approach that we use when catheter ablation fails. It's not an approach that's effective for everyone, but for the right person, it's a highly effective approach. Another approach is something called bipolar ablation. When we have deep tissue circuits, instead of ablating from one side or from the other side of the tissue, we can put catheters on both sides of the tissue and ablate at the, at the same time. When we do this, it turns out that we can make more effective lesions and deeper lesions that can be used to eliminate these um, sometimes very difficult to ablate circuits. The final approach, approach we'll call neuromodulation. This is not a single approach. There's several different ways to achieve neuromodulation. Um, the basic idea is to affect the, the autonomic nervous system. That is, the nervous system that's not voluntary, that, um, uh, for example, this is the same nervous system that that controls the fight or flight response, that adrenaline surge that occurs at times of excitement. And it turns out that this system is very important because this is a system that initiates these tachycardias. Uh, there are a couple of different approaches, again, in order to modulate the, these neural pathways. 
The one that, um, that we're studying in clinical trials that uh, we believe is going to be probably the most effective is something called renal denervation. In this approach, we introduce a catheter to the blood vessels that are going to the kidneys, and we place a few ablation lesions in the wall of the kidneys. And the reason this is effective is that, the, that there are nerves that run within the wall of these blood vessels. And when we ablate these nerves, this affects the sympathetic nervous system, this um, adrenaline surge and this fight or flight response. So the purpose is to blunt the system to decrease the chance of these tachycardias occurring. Fortunately, this neuromodulation or this uh, renal denervation approach is a very simple approach. It only takes about 10 to 15 minutes and it's an extremely safe approach and it's something that may be appropriate for you. So that's our description of uh, ventricular tachycardia um, and, ha and different approaches that one can use in order to manage it, particularly catheter ablation. Again, this may or may not be appropriate for you depending on your particular medical condition. It's something that you should discuss with your doctor. Thank you very much.